So, 3.30, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about um, image denoising, mostly using deep learning. Um, and we're going to talk in particular about a specific application that Shreyas and I have been working on, which is uh, denoising electromicroscope images. So let's try to make this you know, as, as interactive as possible. So feel free to, I mean, I'll, I'll ask if you have any questions, but feel free to interrupt at any point, okay? okay so this is mostly work of Shreyas in collaboration with myself. And we have uh, some collaborators at Arizona State University who are the ones that are experts in electron microscopes. Okay, so the scientific goal in this application is to understand the atomic structure of catalysts. And to see this structure, we image them using an electron microscope. So this is a small joke that our collaborator put in the slide, but it's actually our collaborator, Josh, who does the imaging. And this thing here is the electron microscope that they use for, for imaging. Okay. It essentially throws electrons at um, the material that they're interested in. You measure uh, how the electrons are scattered and that gives you an image at an extremely high resolution as we will see in a moment. So you can even see individual atoms. Um, why are we interested in catalysts? Because uh, this is super important for product manufacturing. So about 90% of all manufactured products involve catalytic processes somewhere in their production chain. And there's enormous impact in energy, healthcare, uh, new materials, transport, and in the environment. So in particular, there are catalysts in cars to remove, um, uh, to remove uh, pollutants from, um, from the exhaust fumes of the cars. Okay, that's a very important uh, application. And in order to understand those catalysts and possibly to improve their design, uh, you want to actually look at their, the atomic structure the atomic structure and you know try to understand what is going on and in order to do that they use this giant electron microscope okay, that's that's the story Shreya, so i don't know if you want to add anything about the application no i mean that, that that's about it so wait yeah so this is what you see you just take the microscope data and you look at it and actually, Sreya, I think this is slightly smooth, right? Yeah, exactly. So here uh, you can still see some structure because to display it, we uh, smooth some things to fit it into the screen. But if you actually look at uh, the raw data that comes out of the microscope, you really cannot see any structure. So just to be clear, these small balls here, they are atoms. So that's the resolution. Resolution is like a million magnification, something like that. But of course, as you can see, there's a lot of noise. This is a single frame. Does the smoothing cause that, like, it looks like there was like a box and then like- Oh, this? It kind of looks like an edge almost, yeah. This is a nanoparticle, which is uh, what actually does this catalysis. The really, really interesting, this is a platinum nanoparticle that is sitting on a support of atoms. Oh, yeah. And this thing actually is what induces chemical reactions as the catalyst. And no, and exactly, sorry, go on, Trey. No, I was just uh, telling that, so this is actually a movie. We are just showing multiple frames back to back. So like some of the fluctuations that you are seeing is pure noise because of, so when you capture two frames consecutively, the noise characteristics change. So that's also like some of these fluctuations that you're seeing. Right, so we should also say, so this is a nanoparticle here. These are all atoms, this support of atoms. Here, there's absolutely nothing. So that's just vacuum, but because of the noise, you see like, you could almost imagine, right, that there's something going on there. There's nothing there. And what they're really interested in is understanding how these atoms dance around while chemical reactions are happening. What causes the noise? Like what is the noise? Oh, the noise. Um, what causes the noise? Uh, Shreya, do you have an answer for this? It's a physical process. Right. So, I mean, it's essentially caused by, uh, so the way they 
So there's noise in all detectors, even in your camera, when photon comes in, there is some noise. But right now it's so advanced that we can suppress a lot of it. So in electron microscope, when this electron comes in, it's a random process. So it's like when it comes in, there is a number that you see on the detector. And yeah, I mean, I don't know how to explain The reason why the noise is so high is that you're actually throwing electrons at this thing. You cannot throw too many electrons. If you throw a lot of electrons, you fry the material. So then you're just going to destroy it and it's going to be useless. Um, if you could throw more electrons, then it would, the noise would be smaller. SR would be lower. Like you're, you're only throwing a few electrons. So then there's like randomness that goes, you know, that uh, affects the, the, um, how you're measuring the electrons that are scattered. It, it's basically that. Like the, the problem is that you cannot send too many electrons in. Maybe the analogy would be when you have a camera, if you're a very low light, so there are not many photons coming in, then there's much more noise. As opposed to when you you know you like it's super bright and there's going to be much less noise. And that's a good question. Any more questions about the data? So that's a single frame. So you know if you just look at this, good luck trying to understand what is happening in this frame. You can't see anything. So we need to remove the noise to see the underlying structure and allow our collaborators to do some science. That's essentially our goal. So we've, uh, we've uh, learned a few different techniques to remove noise in class. Um, actually, maybe it's useful to say what is the rest, like what's the number of pixels in these images, Shreyas? Um, so one frame is close to 1,200 cross 1,200. So it's basically more than a million pixels per frame. So you remember, you know, if you just set it as a giant linear regression problem, it's going to be insane, right? The number of parameters is one million times one million. So no way you can do this. However, as we discuss, you can actually say, okay, like there's going to be some translation invariant structure. So I can maybe fit a linear translation invariant model. And that would be a winner filter. So if we apply a Wiener filter here, this is what we see. Okay, so this is the noisy data, the nanoparticle is essentially around here. The Wiener filter um, produces this image. The issue with this image is that in these parts, there's actually nothing, but the Wiener filter hallucinates that there's actually something. Roughly speaking, it's kind of preserving frequencies that it thinks it's imp are important. Okay, and because of that, it has this huge artifact. It's just a comparison uh, in this zoomed in box. So, has any comments about the winner filter? No, I mean, that, that's exactly it. Like, it basically, uh, the periodic part overpowers it, so it just keeps repeating the periodic part everywhere. There's so much noise, it only manages to find like this strong periodic pattern, which is there. The periodic pattern is actually there. But there's also other structures, right? There's this edge structure that it doesn't uh, manage to preserve. When we apply a wavelet-based method, it's better. I mean, it kind of shows us a bit better that there is some, uh, like there's an edge here, the nanoparticle is here, here outside in the vacuum, you know, doesn't look like atoms anymore, but it's also not great. So if we remember the logic of wavelets is, you say, okay, I have designed this transform such that my image is going to be approximately sparse. So I'm going to threshold or somehow select coefficients that seem important for this image. And that's going to, I'm going to just project the image on those like small number of basic functions, but they are chosen from the image. So it's non-linear in that sense. It's adaptive to the image. Because of that, it usually, it often works better than winner filtering. And here it does, but still there's so much noise that, uh, you know, it's, it's not great. Okay, so because of this, we wanted to apply a neural network to the noise. Okay, so as we discussed um, in the video and in the notes, if you want to train a neural network to the noise this data, you need, so okay, this is kind of like the standard way of applying neural networks. Maybe at the end we'll talk about 
uh, really, really new developments in uh, neural network design where this is not necessary, but we'll leave that to the end. Um, but in general, the idea is I have clean images and the corresponding noisy images, and I'm going to tell the network, okay, take this noisy image, map it to what you think is a clean image, and then you compare it to the truth, and then you do gradient descent on that until the neural network, on many, many examples, until the neural network gets it right. Okay, and the idea is that the neural network implements a non-linear function, so it is able to adapt to its image. Hopefully, if you show it enough examples, eventually, it will do good denoising. Any questions about that? Okay, so the problem that we have here is that where do we get the clean images? Because everything that comes out of the detector is noisy. So if I had something that gave me the clean images, that would mean that I already have a good denoiser. So that logic is a little bit circular. So can you guys think of a way around it? Draw something. Draw, simulate something, I guess you mean. Or, yeah. yeah. So that's exactly what we did. We simulate, well, we did. Our collaborators simulated the images. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. So so do they then how do they know what it should look do they okay that's a very good question. So what they do is actually they sit down and they design like a structure you see it here yeah. on the left, like a 3D structure that they think is plausible. And then they actually have quantum mechanics um, simulations that actually map the, um, the structure that they are assuming to the images that you would observe. Okay, so this is a, a, like a simulated image. This experimental image that has been averaged over many frames to remove the noise. The reason why we cannot do this in general, just removing, like just averaging over many frames is that they're interested precisely in how the atomic structure changes from frame to frame. And that is completely lost. If you do that. Okay. So again, there's a 3D model. This is that, like, you can think of the micro uh, electron microscope as looking at the 3D model from a certain direction. So then you have like a 2D projection in a way. And, um, and then the, what it actually measures depends on uh, the physics of the system, which they can simulate at least to some extent. This, by the way, is the nanoparticle, the platinum nanoparticle that is on this support. However, it is not so easy because there's a lot about the physical measurements that we actually don't know. So we don't know the structure of the nanoparticle precisely because that's in part, that's what we want to find out, especially in its individual frame. We don't know exactly what this plane was that, uh, through which you're seeing it. And there are other imaging parameters, such as the focus or tilt. Tilt is basically how, you're, how the nanoparticle is tilted with respect to the imaging plane that are likely to change even during the acquisition of the experimental data. So what do you think we did about that? Any other simulations that include tilt and different focuses and stuff like that. That's absolutely right. So what we did is we said, okay, well, we, <laughs> again, yeah. our collaborators said, okay, like the tilt is going to be between these values and these values, the defocusing is going to be between these values and these values, and that's just generate a lot of energy. So this shows you how thickness affects things. Um, Shreya, do you remember what thickness actually means physically? Um, it's basically the uh, amount of, so if you go back to that support, it's how, how oh. like in, it's basically how much is over there. How many atoms are here, right? Yeah, the thickness of the support. Actually here, you can see the, um, the dimensions is three nanometers. So 10 to the nine, to the, 10 to the minus nine meter. Right. Right. So that's how thick the material is that we're imaging. Is the important thing like how, like do you see that in the, how things are oriented in the bottom? support like the different easy it's like diagonal to five that's to show you how like with different thicknesses it's kind of weird right because if you're taking a picture and something has different thickness you don't care yeah but in this case 
because this is about like electron scattering and there's just quantum effects or whatever, it actually produces a quite a bit quite a big difference in what you end up seeing. In terms of what they really care about, what they really care about in this particular case is the atomic structure of this thing. That's what they really, really care about. But still, they would want to recover um, you know, everything as, as well as possible. Okay, so this is showing you just how thickness changes the image that appears. Tilt is how like the angle, so here you see it a little bit, like how this whole thing is kind of tilted with respect to the imaging plane. It's one degree, two degrees, three degrees, four degrees. Again, the changes indeed are much more dramatic in the support than in the actual nanoparticle. Any questions about that? And then the focus. So here actually the, like in a camera, it's easier to understand do we know anything about this? Do you know anything about this electromagnetic lens, uh, Shreyas? I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> so I'm not completely sure what they mean by the focus with an electromagnetic lens, but it also produces a difference. And the analogy is when you focus with a camera. So that's the analogy. So you have to you know, worry about all of these parameters and what we do is just include uh, images corresponding to all these different values in the, in the data set. Okay, so, and also, as I said, like they really care about the underlying structure of the nanoparticle. So they basically picked a thousand different models with different thicknesses, nanoparticle sizes, superficial defects, and things like that. And then uh, combining with other imaging parameters, at the end, we have 20,000 simulated images. Okay. Okay, now we have clean images. What else do we need to actually train the network? The actual images, right? But to train the network first. So remember that network is trained to map noisy images to clean images. What we do is we even noisy right. So we need noisy images. You simulate those too? Right. So what we oh. do, that was my next question. We just simulate the noise. Oh yeah. I was not sure if you like actually instead of like took a lot of noisy images, right? Then like kind of I guess it would be hard to make them line up exactly for yeah. And we don't know what's underneath, right? So that's right. the problem. Yeah. We wouldn't know how to match them. But hold that thought because there is a way actually of training neural networks on noisy images directly. I don't have a slide about that, but I think it's worth just mentioning it at the end. It's not obvious, but, but you know, like even very recent work, it's actually possible to train neural networks just with the noisy image. Uh, so indeed, we need noisy images to kind of tell the network, oh, you have to map this noisy image to this clean image. And for that, we have to figure out what the noise distribution is. So in the course, we often say, ah, oh, the noise is additive and Gaussian, but often in life, things are not uh, you know, additive and Gaussian. And in this particular case, it's not, it's uh, Poisson. So do you want to explain this a little bit, Sreya? Uh, um, so, I mean, one, uh, we have reasons to sus or believe that it's Poisson. So the detector physics tells you that it's Poisson. And it's also the same thing that happens in your camera. And you take pictures in low light conditions, the noise is predominantly Poisson. So we have a starting point and the physics tells us that it's Poisson. And the next thing we did is we sort of experimentally verified that it's Poisson. So uh, on the bottom panel, what you're seeing is an average of 40 frames, a spatial average of 40 frames. So for each spatial location, we have 40, sort of like 40 noise realizations. So we assume that we make a simplifying assumption that when you have 40 frames, that's the real data that we have. The underlying structure is constant. Now, if you make that assumption, each of this frame can be thought of as a realization of that clean frame. Now we look at each of those pixels and we first make a histogram. So if you look at that histogram, it's actually in, I forget what's here. Yeah, this, yeah, this is, yeah, but this histogram is, the count is actually in log scale. So you can see that it's falling off like this, almost like a straight line. 
um, like if you go from 10 power one, like zero to six, the heights are almost falling off in a straight line, which mm -hmm. actually means that the counts follow a Poisson distribution. So essentially here, here we were just looking at the uh, distribution of counts in each of these regions. And we say that the empirical distribution is very close to Poisson. So something and, that might be confusing with Shreyas is that counts. Why are we talking about counts? The way these images are acquired is you count electrons. Right. Uh, so here I'm talking about the counts of intensities. So if you look at the noisy data, how many zeros were there, how many ones were there, how many twos were there, and so on. And that's like the number of electrons captured by a sensor. Exactly. So the number of electrons follow a Poisson distribution. That's that, 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 that's what happens. How many sensors are there? They have like an array of sensors. It's like in your camera. In your camera, you have an array that like where the photons hit. In this case, it's like an array where electrons hit. Like each, each spatial location that you capture is a sensor. Like the brighter a dot looks in the, like that's gonna be placed as a higher count. Yeah, yeah, so that actually that's, there's for every pixel, there's like a detector. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. That's what we call a pixel. Like the pixel that we define is only as fine as the detector array that we have. Yeah, I mean, there was actually a better picture, but we did not put it in the slide. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think the picture is fine. So something important to point out is, so as Reyes was saying, um, like maybe the easiest way, maybe like the easiest way to think, think of it is in this vacuum region. So in this vacuum region, we know that under lift there's, there's some constant value. Okay, and that's all there should be. Yeah, because we basically, uh, because we have done, we have taken all of these frames and averaged them in time, we realize that actually over there, there's never anything. So we take all of these pixels and we put a histogram of the pixels. That's kind of going to tell us what um, the distribution of the pixel intensities are when the underlying pixels have a constant value. And this is what is shown here. And what we see is that it's very consistent with a Poisson distribution, which is what we see here. Right, Reyes? Yeah, there it's a simulated Poisson distribution on the simulated clean image. So you can actually compare both of them and see that they're very close to each other. And then you could say, oh, but maybe in the part that we're interested in, like this part that has the nanoparticle or this part that has the support, maybe the distribution is different. So the distribution is definitely different. But the question is, is it only because the underlying intensities are higher because there's something? Or is it because the distribution is actually different? And here we see that it has essentially the same shape, which indicates to us that it's also possible. Yeah. Okay. So it's important to point out that uh, we have seen other data sets where because of um, you know, uh, different reasons, you don't have like a, such an easy distribution that it, you know, like it's not just Poisson. Right, Treyas? Yes, yeah. I mean, actually, I think this was the only data set where it was pure Poisson. Every other data set we got from, got from our collaborators, the noise distribution was much more complex. And something that is very important for denoising is the fact that it seems that the noise is IID, meaning that the noise between two pixels is, is uncorrelated, like it's independent. Of course, they, like the two pixels are not independent because of their underlying structure, right? If they don't both belong to the same atom, then their values are going to be very much dependent. But the actual noise that corrupts is actually independent, which is really helpful. Right, uh, Carlos, like just to add to that, uh, that was that assumption is more required for the unsupervised methods. Here I know, it's, I know, but still. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's correct. That's actually crucial for the like this technique that I explained before, where um, we use we use just noisy images to denote. Are the unsupervised methods? Are you guys just trying to find structures you don't even know if they exist? Actually, maybe we can explain quickly. So the, these unsupervised methods that uh, Shreyas refers to, in those methods, what you tell the network to do is you tell it to approximate each pixel using every other pixel. Then, but you tell it to approximate the noisy pixel. The idea is that if you ask it to approximate the noisy pixel using every other pixel, including that pixel, what it's going to do is just going to copy that value and it's going to be useless. But, if you don't allow it to use that particular pixel, this actually uh, induces the network to denoise. 
yeah. because it has to kind of look around and try to figure out how to map the rest of the pixels uh, to, sorry, how to like use the rest of the noisy pixel to estimate that particular pixel. If the noise is independent, this actually forces the network to denoise. That's called blind spot denoising. Again, like this uh, is not, not the focus here, but well, sorry. Yeah. I'm mean, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, uh, one question. Uh, the method you mentioned is that similar to the local linear embeddings, kind of to estimate the weights for the neighbors, kind of. Local linear embeddings. So, yeah, it's kind of, go on. Yeah, I mean, I think the first part is just uh, to estimate uh, the weights for the neighbor of, of the, the data point or something like, yeah. Yeah, so this is not, these are not linear weights. Maybe let's get back to this when we talk about the actual convolutional network. Okay. How about that? And then we'll, we'll get back to this blind spot method because that, that's kind of cool actually. Sure. Um, anyway, here, basically the idea is when you look at the data, you figure out what the noise is so that you can also simulate, okay? So any more questions about that? And now we're prepared to tell the network, okay, from this terrible, terrible looking image, you need to give me this. Okay. Which, I mean, if you're the network, it seems like, you know, a tall order. Um, okay, so the network actually works through convolutions, as we explained in the lecture notes and in the video. If there was just a single convolutional layer, it would be a winner filter. You wouldn't be able to do better than a winner filter. It's essentially like reweighting the Fourier coefficients, and we see that, that that doesn't work very well. We already saw that, okay? So there's just too much noise. Uh, but uh, crucially, in neural networks, we include nonlinearity. So this is just a cartoon uh, depiction of what the nonlinearity that we typically use in denoising is, which is rectifying. A linear unit, which basically just takes each entry that is put into it, and the negative ones, it just sets them to zero. So it's a very dumb nonlinearity. There's nothing sophisticated about it. Something quite nice about it is that when you take the gradient with respect to this nonlinearity, it's very easy to do because it's just a zero and then linear. And um, the, the, the gradient does not get small because there are other nonlinearities that kind of saturate where the gradients get very small and that's kind of a problem where you're training neural networks. And I know that I'm kind of talking about this in a really vague way, but that's just so, you know, in case you're, you're interested, that's kind of a big, big deal in, in neural networks, how the gradient of these things look. Treyas is actually the expert in this, so do you have any other comments? No, man, that's it. Okay, feel free to just, you know, interrupt. Sure. Okay, so, the network that we started with is a standard architecture for denoising that was introduced in 2017. And it's really simple. You basically have convolutions with many different filters. Then you apply rectifying nonlinearities. Then you have more convolutions with different filters. Then you apply rectifying nonlinearities and so on and so forth. There's this thing called here called batch normalization where you do some kind of normalization in between. Uh, yeah, that's not too important. Okay, but essentially it's convolutions rectifying filters. I forget how many layers, Shreyas. This one had 20 layers. 20 layers, so it's very deep. Okay, is it clear what's going on? So you have like this kind of weighted averages to kind of make a new different image. So here there are 64 filters. So for each filter, you're gonna do these weighted averages that are going to give you 64 different images. And then those again are going to be pulled together. Like basically you're going to apply filters to those and you're going to add them together, right, Treyas? Yes. And then you put them through rectifying, only, uh, rectifying things where all the negative entries get set to zero. Um, you might be tempted to try to follow what's going on here when denoising is happening. It's maddening, like you, you won't know. Mm -hmm. Like it's super complicated. Like you get like 64 different images here that get them like merged together and there are 64 new images that are made from that. And then they're merged together again. Uh, at every layer, the negative entries get set to zero. It's very, very difficult. 
I mean, it's actually intractable to just kind of look at it and, and make sense of it, okay? But as we will see a little bit later on, we can still analyze it in some ways to get some idea of what uh, strategies the, the networks are using to, to denoise. Any questions about this? Okay. So um, these are the results. Okay, so the results are actually quite impressive when you compare them to what um, um, what wavelet denoising or winner filters do. Okay, in particular, you know, you don't have like, well, actually, it's it is better than wavelet denoising, right, Shreyas? Right. Yeah. I mean, um, in terms of PSNR, it's about five or six points better. This measure here is basically the signal to noise ratio, which is basically um, here we have ground truth because we know the simulated images. But we will show you the results on the, the real data a bit later. But this is just kind of sanity checking the method on uh, clean images. Since we know the ground truth, we can compute the ratio between them. Between them, and, and that's um, this is our, our measure for how well we're doing. I mean, you know, as we will see in a moment, we were not satisfied with this, but this is pretty crazy that you can estimate this from just this. But Sreyas was not happy. <laughs> he was thinking, how can we improve this? Um, do you guys have any suggestions? I mean, you know, like, don't, it's not like a, there's, there is an answer in how this was improved, but we're not expecting you to come up with it. Run another denoiser. Run another denoiser. You mean on the same, on top of it? On a final image. Like, That's kind of interesting. Maybe like, just like uh, edge detection type thing. So, okay, there's two actually two interesting notions there. First, running the denoiser again. So. Shreyas actually in a previous project was working on um, image denoising where you were expecting images with different noise levels. And you actually tried something like that, right, Shreyas? Yeah. There was a recurrent, um, like you denoise and then you take the denoised image and the initial noisy image together and then you do one more step of denoising and so on. It's like we were calling it recurrent denoising. In this case, for the neural networks, it doesn't help very much. Something else that you said that is very interesting is you could actually see, you kind of see where the edge structure is and then maybe you can use that to denoise better. Those, that kind of methodology was actually what people used to do before neural networks. Apart from, okay, there's wavelet denoising, there's winner filtering, but there's also other nonlinear approaches where people would be like, oh, I kind of see my edge structure. So why don't I do local averages that are adaptive to that structure? And that's, you know, those were some of the state of the art Oh, um, approaches before neural networks. And we'll see in a moment that what the neural network actually does is kind of related to that, interestingly. Okay, so Shreyas was not happy. He was saying, how can we improve it? And then he realized that, I, I think you probably realized this, right, Shreyas? I don't remember yeah. The, yeah. the history of this. I mean, we actually did the, uh, I was trying to do the analysis and that's when I realized that the receptive field was quite low. So the receptive field of the neural network is how many pixels are being used to estimate each of the output pixels. Okay, so in the winner filter, you remember like we're doing convolution with a filter, like how big is that filter? Essentially gives you the receptive field of the winner filter. So in this case, if you had a single convolutional layer, it would be like that's how big is the filter of that layer, but because we have, um, you know, different layers one after the other, the receptive field is basically. I mean, so yes, I don't know how to explain this very well. Oh, ah, here, yes, you have a picture. This is the picture. So, do you want to explain this picture a little bit? Sure. Actually, um, can you go to the previous picture so that I can start from there? So here, um, the convolutional filter is three cross three. So if you look at each pixel in the green feature map it basically looks at a three cross three region in the original image to compute that now when you go to the next image so you see that when you have the first round of convolution you use a three cross three region in the first uh, first image to compute 
every every pixel in the green one now if you do another three cross three on the green one to go to the orange one then you will be actually looking at a five cross five region in the original image so but as you go deeper like you stack on um, larger regions in the original image after the 20 layers you end up with a larger field of view but still not super large in fact after the 20 layers your field of view is just like this okay like this red uh, squares show you how big the receptive field of the DNCNN is. So the issue here is that there's a lot of structure, like periodic structure, that you're not going to be able to capture in this way because you're looking at just a small number of pixels. Okay, so what did you do then, Sreya? Uh, okay, and you cannot like, see really structure in those pixels. Yeah, sorry, so, in those small regions. So we basically used a different architecture to increase the receptive field quite a lot. And this architecture is very much inspired by wavelet decompositions that you saw, where there is downsampling operations and downsampling. So if you perform a downsampling operation, you can immediately double your receptive field. So this lets you a way to increase the receptive field efficiently without exploding the number of parameters. So maybe to explain briefly, this is a, an architecture that was introduced for image segmentation. And when it was introduced, like it was a big deal because it does as much better than anything else. And the idea is that you apply small filters here, okay? And then you map them to the outside. So you still have like some small filters, but here you downsample your image so that effectively it's as if you're applying really large filters, which is a little bit like in wavelets where we had like these basis functions that were dilations and then bigger dilations and then bigger dilations to try to capture different scales. So this thing does it like that, like by applying filters to downsample version, downscale versions or downsample versions of the image and then it upscales them again. So you don't need to understand the details here, but um, as, as Reya said, basically this is kind of inspired by wavelet decompositions. You design the architecture so that the, the filters, the effective filters, have different um, scales, and some of them are quite large. So it gives you a bigger field of view. Okay. And again, this works really, really well for segmentation. So the when you downsample, you still like split it into two images. Uh, um, by downsampling, we just mean like blurring and uh, reducing the number of pixels, as if you were seeing just as like downscale version. Of I mean, an easier version, uh, an easiest downsampling operation would be uh, think about every four cross four square and then you replace it with the average of that. So a two cross two square and then you replace it with the average of that. So if you just keep doing that, you will reduce the dimension by half. Right, and you do this in this second level and then you reduce it even more and then you reduce it even more. But you're still keeping also like these small filters here because you probably need also a very fine scale details to do a good job. Um, did you, I mean, did you just, this sounds like a good solution, but uh, did you just not include more layers of the neural network because that just like gets more computationally? That's an, that's an excellent question, Shreya. So, I mean, as you saw over there, we used about 20 layers to get a field of view of 41 cross 41. And that 20 layers is about 600,000 parameters. Now we were effectively aiming for a, so at the end, uh, the best method that worked had a receptive field for more than 300 plus 300. So if you had to just stack on layers and get that much receptive field, it would be a giant network. Yeah. And unfortunately, NYU doesn't provide enough computation to <laughs> try, try anything like that. So when, when Shreya trains these things, they go into GPUs. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this wouldn't fit basically, right, Shreya? Yeah, and also it would be very difficult to train because the number of parameters is just too huge. Yeah. So you can just like uh, increase the size of the convolution. Right, oh, so. Go on. Uh, I mean, there's actually some uh, arguments that we can we do based on our parameterization, but an empirical observation is that if you increase the size of the convolution, you also typically need much more number of channels. So you saw in DNCNN that in each layer you had 64 channels. 
but if you increase the number of con uh, if you increase the size of convolution layers usually to make it work work at the same level you also need to increase the number of channels and so on so it just becomes uh, again it runs into computational issues and so on these are very good questions and in fact it's stuff that we actually thought about when we were trying to mostly straight make this work so these are the results once you increase the receptor field to how, how much did you set did you say is right um this network uh, where we use this results it's around 250 plus 250. oh quite a bit better it's actually in my opinion pretty insane that it, it is able to do this with uh with this noise level notice that it's not completely perfect eh? you have some artifacts yeah. Around it. yeah actually carlos like i forgot to change these images these are the models from last November, and right now they are much better. Yeah, so, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so this is just to compare with DNCNM, and the, like the, the difference is actually quite uh, quite marked. This is another example, because again, this is simulated data, so we actually know the clean image. So um, something that is interesting to think about maybe is, okay, so this actually gave us like a, a very big improvement where we changed the, the field of view in the case of uh, electron microscope images. So this table here basically shows you the number of parameters of these different networks that Shreya tried. And uh, these are the fields of view. And these are the results in PSNF. Okay, so the higher the better. So here, what we see is that as you increase the field of view, you get uh, like a significant increase in PSNR. So you need that you're denoising much better. And this is uh, logarithmic. So it's actually you're denoising really much better. Um, and this is a number of parameters. This is just to show you that it's like the important thing is the field of view, not necessarily the number of parameters of the network. This is important in deep learning because you can convince yourself that different things matter because we don't understand these models well at all. It's very important to do careful ablation studies to realize exactly what it is that is giving you better performance. Okay, so I think this is the most important probably take home lesson from, from this example. Um, so here you see that it is the field of view as opposed to the number of parameters that really matters to increase the PSNR to do better. A question that you could wonder about is, okay, so then why do people use this other network for photographs for natural images, because that's like the reason why we're using it from the beginning. Why don't you just increase the field of view there? Maybe you'll get better results. So this shows you that you don't, basically. Like here in this bottom table, Shreya supply um, different networks with different fields of views to natural images. And uh, what he realized is that it makes essentially no difference. Do you want to venture like a, you know, a guess of, we all, we're also just guessing, yeah? like we have some ideas about why this is the case. Um, do you want to venture some guesses out why there's a big deal for electron microscope images, but not so much for photographs? There's basically two reasons that we, why we think this is the case. So those of you who are on Zoom also, please feel free to chip in. I mean, is there one, it's kind of like you wouldn't in a natural image, I guess, like you're not, I don't know, I guess is, is there more correlation between the pixels than you would expect in a natural image? It's a bit like that. So when you think about the correlation between pixels, in these images that we're seeing here, oops, sorry, here, um, there's a lot of periodic structure. So this pixel all the way over here and this pixel all the way for over here are actually quite correlated because of this periodic structure. Whereas in a natural image that tends to happen much, much less. Mm. So there's a lot of periodicity here that is really like, you actually have to see a big chunk of the image to actually appreciate their periodicity. Whereas in most natural images, that will not happen. Mm -hmm. There's not strong periodicity. 
So that's one reason. The other reason is that the noise level is crazy. Like the noise level here is, is just insane. When you see noisy natural images, they, they won't have this level of noise. It's, just, it's almost absurd to consider this level of noise for a natural image. You are never going to uh, measure an image with so much noise. Um, I have a question on the, like, the next slide, I think. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between, I guess, for the last one, it's like the 893 by 893. It's like the same number of base channels, but oh, sorry, in the previous table. Um, so that one, like the only difference between that and then the one above it is just like that you're telling the model that you want, like. Um, so those two, uh, the number of, uh, so the scales or the number of times you're downsampling increased more in the last model when compared to the previous one. So we'll um, go back to the UNET, maybe that would be helpful. Yeah, exactly. How many times you go down? Gotcha. Right. Did that just take like a lot longer than the other ones? Like, or is it not worth the improvement before? Or is that like the best model? Like, I'm sorry, what was the question? The like 890, that, the 893 one, is, that's like, is this our best model? Is yeah. The question. Yeah, I mean that's the best model. Yes, true. And the another question, related question that you asked is, does it take a long time to up, to use it? Yeah. Like, is it well, no, no. I mean, um, so training is computationally a bit more exp expensive, but at the time of inference, that is when you just want to apply the model to a noisy image, all of them are quite fast. But still, these models are really large, right? Because right, I mean, you could not just apply it on your computer. Right, I mean, you, you cannot apply any of these models on your laptop. Yeah. So typically you need a, uh, you need a computer with a GPU so that you can do convolutions much more efficiently. Are you for these uh, models? Sorry, yeah. I'm, I, I cannot, I did How not- How do you the store this model? Um, I mean, just, uh, there, are, there are ways to, so depending on which framework you use, like PyTorch, TensorFlow and so on, there are ways to store the models, but the basic idea would be uh, you'd store the convolute the weights of each convolutional channel and anything else that you need, like batch number parameters and so on. And at the end, you just put them together. So you basically just store those things, the parameters of. So here I will have to store around 70 million numbers, 70 million floating point numbers. And they're in the computer cluster. Yeah. So very good question. So again, the motivation here was saying, okay, so why is this suddenly making a big difference? Whereas for natural images, it actually does not. And the answer is probably because um, the important features in natural images are not so periodic. So you don't need to actually have such a large field of view to see them. And also the noise is not as high. Okay, so, oops, this is, um, this is what the real data look like after we have the noise. And again, so this is slightly smooth, but I mean, look at the output of the, I don't get tired of looking at this. <laughs> at this. And you can also see, you know, the atoms moving a little bit, like that's actually what they want to find out. So when you go um, and you show something like this to, um, a scientist like our collaborator, Peter, who is at, in Arizona, he will say something like, this looks great, but what's going on here? Um, right, like how, how is this thing actually denoising? In fact, they ask even more difficult questions, which is how sure am I that actually what I'm seeing here is actually the truth and the network is just not inventing it. So for the simulated data, I mean, one answer to that is, okay, look, in the simulated data is actually working and we know the ground truth. Um, but we also try to do some analysis to actually show them how the network was denoising. And this is based on a Jacobian analysis where basically um, what happens is we take a look at, let's just think about each individual pixel because that's what's easiest to think of. Um, we look at each individual uh, output pixel and we see what its dependence is on the input pixel. Okay. And now we can think what is the 
gradient of this function. Meaning, what, um, uh, what is the direction where if I modify the input in that direction, the output pixel changes the most? Was that a little bit clear at least? So again, it's the, this function that where the network is mapping the input to the output, we basically do if you want to tailor the composition of that and we just linearize. Maybe it will be clearer here. So the idea is this, we have the noisy signal and we're interested in a specific pixel, this guy. Okay, this is the denoised pixel and it's computed with this field of view, okay? Like doing some kind of function that includes all of this, okay, this area in this red square. That function is super complicated. It's like, has like this half a million parameters or more, like super, super complicated. But you can ask, what is the gradient of that function at this point? Meaning if I change the input to that function in a particular direction, what's the direction that would produce the most change in the function? You can roughly think of this as if you're linearizing. Okay. When we do that, we find this gradient. This, because we're linearizing, this means that if you take the inner product between the noisy image, so in this case, it's a denoid, but like basically this small square and this gradient, this will give you the estimated pixel. That's what we mean by linearization, okay? And what's kind of cool is that you realize that the network is on the one hand using very local structure. It says, okay, I realize that there's some kind of atom here. So let me average over all of these guys. But it also realizes that there's periodic structure. So let me also average a little bit with this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. This guy. And it also reinforces some edges, which is why you see some negative parts here. Interestingly, this is adaptive. So it will do different things depending on what pixel we're talking about. So this was a pixel that was on the support. Things are very periodic. On the nanoparticle, things are less periodic. So it uses less uh, things around it. If we look at what happens in the vacuum, here you don't even see what's going on, but basically it's just averaging over all of it. Like it's super spread out. It says like, I, there's nothing here. I can just do like a super spread out. Atom. When we're on the surface of the nanoparticle, where there's not that much periodic structure anymore, it's really just averaging that particle and very little for anything else. However, we do see some, I mean, it should probably not average from here. So, you know, it's not completely precise. Um, this brings us back to your, your point previously about um, this adaptive uh, filtering, adaptive, you know, knowing all, you know, like the structure of my data is roughly like this. So why don't I adapt the averaging that I'm doing? Before neural networks, we used to do these things by hand. And by hand, I mean, you uh, detected edges or whatever, and you said, okay, I'm only going to average within those edges, or I'm going to adapt, like I'm doing, going to do adaptive averages based on what I think is under there. The neural network, which we train in a completely data-driven way, apparently does this automatically. And we can see this because of this uh, linearization okay, by just computing the gradient and visualizing. Something important to realize is, sorry, go on. Sorry. Uh Sorry, I won't answer it, right? I mean, it looks very cool, but I'm just not fully understand that. Uh, how do you get this gradient uh, plot? So you, you have a noise uh, patch, you have a denoise patch, and how do you get uh, this gradient? Right, sorry. Yeah, no. So we're only talking about the function that maps this noisy path to this single denoised uh, pixel, okay? Yeah. So that is a function that is, if this path, then let's say for uh, simplicity that this patch is 100 by 100. So it's a function from dimension 10,000 to one. Okay? Yeah. And it's given by the neural network. So we can just take a gradient of that. The gradient is going to be dimension 10,000. It's going to have the partial derivatives of each uh, of the output pixel with respect to each of the input pixels. I see. These are the partial derivatives. Right. And what I see, I see. So, yeah, so the output is just uh, one pixel and the input is 10,000 pixels. I see, yeah. Absolutely. And Thanks. these are the partial derivatives of each input pixel with respect to that output pixel. 
Okay, yeah. This is a linear, very local linear analysis, but still it's, it's actually pretty cool that it kind of tells you a little bit what's going on. Actually, so that's it, but I'm gonna show you again the gradients because I like looking at them. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that, that it is able to actually adapt to different parts of the image completely automatically, and it figures out what kind of averaging it needs to do. Yeah. So why do they want these kind of images? Like even the final image doesn't seem so useful to me. Oh, this. I know, like uh, the result. Oh, the result. Okay. So what do they want the result? Yeah. Because then they look at this, and they say, okay, this atom is jumping at this particular time, which means that the 3D structure, like the nanoparticle, is actually changing. And that allows them to understand uh, what is happening during a chemical reaction. So this is just enough for them. Because looking at this, I would want like to go from this to like the 3D oh, structure. I'm glad that you point that out because we have a project to try to do that. <laughs> Where basically in that project, what we're saying is, can we train a network to tell us how many atoms are in this column? Because here there's some atoms behind. Can it tells us, oh, can it tell us, oh, there's three atoms behind, or there's five, or there's six, because that's really what they want. You're completely correct. So what they really want to understand is how the 3D structure of this thing is changing, but we don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're taking it step by step. In any case, for them, it's actually super important to have good denoisers, because they, uh, otherwise they would be fooled by the noise when they're just looking at the data. They spend a lot of time looking at the data. So having something that actually removes noise is very useful for them to figure out how things are going. But you're completely correct. At the end of the day, what they really would like is how is the 3D structure of the nanoparticle chain? But I mean, compare that, I mean, let me remind you what they actually look at often. They actually look at uh, images that are denoised with winner filters. They would look at things like this. I mean, this is completely garbage uh, with respect to what uh, the neural network actually output. But even stuff like that is kind of useful for them because they see the periodicities and they can be meaningful. Any more questions? So are these like on existing, they're looking at existing catalysts and stuff, like, or are they, or is this kind of being applied, this is just like a general application for this, like is this being applied to new things they're testing out or are they trying to understand- That's a good question. After it's created? It depends on the group. Our collaborators are more interested in like fundamental knowledge, let's put it like this. So what is actually happening during chemical reactions as opposed to actually designing the catalyst and verifying that they do what they should be doing. So then like when things are being made, like does that help you? Like people are just randomly making polymers and stuff and like they don't, they don't. I know it's not the same people do, but like you would think that when things are getting made, there's like a general understanding of the chemical Oh, um, you'd be surprised. So I there's, mean, I guess there's, not. <laughs> no, you would be surprised because I mean I have no idea about this. So this yeah. disclaimer, maybe Shreya by now has learned a bit more. Like, uh, but my understanding is that some parts are well understood. Other parts, uh, they tried out stuff. It worked out. So it's like their own neural networks. And then, yeah, isn't that also kind of what's happening in AI, or like in neural nets and data science right now? It's we're doing yeah. science in a way as opposed to maybe like, yeah. Okay. So like, I mean, just to emphasize our collaborators in particular, um, they are interested in imaging this at a very high speed, which is why they get so much noise. Like they need a lot of frames on that. And so they have very few electrons per frame. So the noise is super high because they want to understand the dynamics of these atoms when, um, chemical reactions are happening and a lot is unknown about. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's basically it. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.